All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'll start with uh, introducing myself. I'm Saru Mukherjee Sharma. I'm a mom. I have a five-year-old son. And I'm also a digital content creator. I talk about parenting, lifestyle, beauty, and women empowerment on my page, Diapers and Lipsticks, on Instagram. You guys can find me and follow me. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I was uh, born in West Bengal, Birbhum, and uh, brought up in Punjab, Luthiana, and currently living, also married to a Punjabi, <laughs> and currently living in Gurgaon from the last 10 years. So, yeah, I've been living in a very multicultural setup all my life. <laughs> so, that's about me. And uh, we have here with us uh, Sharan Sharanya. Shreyana. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Shreyana. I have a friend actually, Sharanya, which is why I keep getting confused. <laughs> uh, Sharanya Bhattacharya. Uh, she's an economist, all of you, as uh, she introduced already, and, uh, and the renowned author of the book, Desperately Seeking Shah Rukh Khan. So, uh, Shriana, why don't we start the conversation by getting to know you a little bit. Uh, well, firstly, thank you so much for inviting me and it's nice to meet all of you. Um, just as background, uh, 15 years ago when I finished my master's in economics before I was running off to do a PhD, if somebody told me I would write a book called Desperately Seeking Shah Rukh, uh, India's Lonely Young Women, I'd say, get out of here. Like, what are you talking about? Um, but actually, if you look at the book, it's actually, uh, it is a work of economics. Um, and I'll explain a little bit how in a bit. Yeah. Um, but I think background for me is I'm a giant Shah Rukh Khan fan. I am an economist. My focus is on women's employment. How many people here know that India now has the bot one of the lowest female employment rates in the world? Just raise your hand. Yeah, so the book really sort of delves into that and the history of it, maybe I can just go there. Uh, I'm really not that interesting. The book is far more interesting than me. Um, the history of the book is uh, in 2006, I had just finished my master's at Delhi University and I had been trained in how to collect quantitative data, you know, surveys. Again, how many people here have done surveys, conducted surveys? So you know how frustrating that process can be. And so I was sent to a slum in Ahmedabad where women were making garments and incense sticks at home, earning about a quarter of minimum wage. And I was supposed to essentially collect quantitative data on their wages, hours of work, working conditions. Um, when I showed up, I was very excited, very young. This was the first survey I was going to do in the field. I was very excited to be in the field. And of course, when I showed up, all these ladies looked incredibly bored. They had been uh, subjected to survey investigators four times over. I was not the first person in Khadi with uh, Kajal in their eyes that they had met who was asking them these questions. Many of them were actually unionizing themselves. They were part of an organization called SEVA, which some of us may have heard of here. It's the largest union of working women in the world, still continues to be. And they essentially told me that, you know, this is just really boring, these questions. We've answered these questions and the government doesn't seem to care about the responses. So can we talk about something else? And, you know, in research, you're often taught that you can take a break. You know, you use icebreakers. So in the book, I describe this as a research recess. Uh, and I started to talk to these women about their favorite actor. And everywhere I went, uh, I met Shah Rukh fans. And I am a giant Shah Rukh fan, as I introduced myself as. Um, and what was interesting is that I, I, I sensed the same NOI and general boredom and lethargy with the survey process in different sites that I was researching. So moving from Ahmedabad, I was part of a project on domestic workers in Jharkhand, and these were women who were migrating from Jharkhand to Delhi, and Gurgaon, in fact, uh, to work as paid domestic workers uh, in rural Uttar Pradesh in an area called Rampur. Um, again, women making embroidery work at home. Um, and everywhere I met uh, women who didn't like traditional survey questions, and women who loved Shah Rukh Khan. And when I started to look at the notes, this is between 2006 to around 2008 is when I met the series of this informal fan club. 
I realized actually when I was looking at the conversations that we were having, none of us was actually talking about Shah Rukh because none of us know him. We were all talking about how difficult it is for women to find purchasing power, um, independent income, to actually watch an actor they like. So, you know, often we think of film fandom as just some silly cultural hobby. Actually, it's an economic act. It's an economic tra activity because to be a fan, to follow the work of an artist, you require money, you require access to markets, you require access perhaps now to a mobile phone, you need access to media, and you also need access to safe, inclusive spaces to actually just go giggle, laugh, fun, you know, stargaze at. And I'll give you a statistic which I describe in the book. Six out of 10 people in an Indian cinema hall are men. And as per the last uh, survey that the NFHS put out, it's quite depressing, 8% of women reported watching a full-length film in the previous month. Only 8% of women in the country. So all of us who, are, who have easy access to film, we are part of this very privileged, tiny bubble of a minority. And I think these conversations intrigued me. And I thought, well, it might be interesting to see where these women's lives go. Are they ever able to actually watch Shah Rukh in peace? And so when the book is desperately seeking Shah Rukh, it's not some silly quest for a celebrity. It's actually these women seeking their economic freedom to just be able to pursue their own pleasure, to just laugh, smile, giggle, stargaze. And I followed them from 2006 till around 2019 which is what the book is, so it's nearly 15 years of their life, my life, um, and also the career of actor Shah Rukh Khan. And one rule I had is I did not uh, want to ask people direct questions about their lives. I found that very tedious and somewhat tacky. And uh, I also realized it was incredibly boring for many people. Um, and so I would only talk to them about Shah Rukh. And what's fascinating, I think, for those who read the book or who have a sense of the book, is actually as you start to talk to these women about his icon, they start talking about the men in their lives, their own families, um, masculinity, what is it, what, what is this idealized male that they want who is supportive. Suddenly there are conversations about all the times they feel discriminated, harassed, abused, or just heartbroken, because that is usually when they watch his films for escape, relief, comfort, fun, right? And I actually write in the book that you know, nothing but the deepest dissatisfaction with reality drives us to dwell in fantasy. And in fact, the book is about these grim realities that many of these women face. And so that's the context of the book. Uh, Shah Rukh is a metaphor for economic freedom. But the other thing that then started to strike me as I continued on in these conversations sometime in 2013 is, you know, in standard social science, it's very common for someone who's quite elite to study and write about someone who is not as privileged as them. And one thing I really wanted to do was, uh, especially when I was going through ethical clearances for the interviews, you know, people who do qualitative research have to go through some conduct boards and so on. One of the things that I was really committed to doing was I wanted to introduce more reciprocity in the text. And of course, that's difficult given the amount of social distance between myself and many of the women I was encountering. But I realized one way to do it was to open up the socioeconomic scope of the book. So the book now includes people like me, uh, my story is in there. Uh, it also includes other upper caste women, fairly educated, uh, fairly mobile. And so it is a rainbow coalition of different class groups. But the one thing I'll just close with is, uh, it's not a book about Shah Rukh Khan. Shah Rukh Khan knows it's not a book about Shah Rukh Khan. Uh, it's a book about contemporary Indian womanhood. And in fact, what's really powerful about Mr. Khan's icon, at least in this book, is the stories he allows these women to share about themselves. Uh, because each time they watched a Kal Ho Na Ho or a Zero, they will tell you what happened in their life when they were watching that movie. And this is true, by the way, for all of us. Um, I can bet if someone here likes football or cricket and I start talking to you about a match, sure, you'll tell me about the match, but then immediately you'll start telling me about the circumstances in your life and how is it that you actually ended up seeking that pleasure. So from a social science perspective, I think the books gain some interest only because it's a very unusual prism not to look at people's lives just from the perspective of poverty, deprivation, but to actually approach people's lives through pleasure, fun, joy as a way of actually talking to them and eliciting responses. 
Uh, so that's Shah Rukh. Shah Rukh taught me to do social science somewhat differently. Um, and he's a springboard in this book for women just telling their own stories. Um, and I hope uh, some of you will consider just perusing them um, as we move forward. Absolutely. In fact, I'm also looking forward to reading Yeah, this. you must consider you and I have the same. She exactly. and I both are uh, fake Bangalis <laughs> because we're both Bangalis, but we're yes, both brought up in Punjab yes, because we're, we're both Punjabis, both of us. <laughs> so we're more Punjabis than uh, Bengalis. Yeah, and we are both ardent fans of Shah Rukh Khan, which we just found out. Because we have good taste. <laughs> <laughs> and not because uh, Shah Rukh is a great actor, but as a person, I really admire him, the way he speaks, and uh, I, I really enjoy his interviews more than his movies. Yeah, that's a theme that comes up in the book constantly, especially for elite educated fans. Right. Also because, you know, he's the first actor who had access to so much satellite TV. I mean, India liberalized around the time he became a superstar. So even if you had stars like Shashi Kapoor in the past who were wonderful orators, and would be very open about you know what was going on in their lives. They just had DD. Now suddenly Shah Rukh had Star TV. There were all these channels. You would come back home, you'd switch on TV, and you'd see an interview of his as a kid. I think so exactly. many of us who were born in the 80s, growing up in the 90s. I can see this lady smiling because she's, she knows what I'm talking about. You would have watched an interview of his. I have women in the book who said to me, growing up in the middle of you know nowhere, said. I learned the phrase middle class because he kept using the phrase middle class in his interviews. And these are women who didn't know about Manmohan Singh's budget, they didn't know about economic liberalization, but they knew that Shah Rukh Khan was liberalization because suddenly he was standing on top of a truck uh, saying Dil Mange more, so the country wanted more. Uh, they knew middle class because he kept using it and it's really interesting, I think going back to what I was just saying earlier, the, the way people use these interviews. To right. also just comment on contemporary affairs in the country and the economy. Absolutely, and I, I feel like uh, you rightly said, like we all we we are in we have the privilege to you know live in a metro city, living a good life. We are all financially independent, most of us, and we live in a, this bubble that you know uh, that. Things are changing, uh, you know, country is progressing. Uh, and, and before uh, you said that, you know, we, India is the most uh, underemployed in, in terms of women. That, was, that came as a shock to me because I was thinking that, we, you know, we are progressing. Now everybody is, you know, moving out and uh, people are opening up basically. So uh, one thing I wanted to, you know, sort of understand because you, ha you have uh, communicated with I think so many women who are underprivileged and also women from all sects of life. What is that one thing that's common uh, of all, amongst all Indian women, uh, you would say, um, no matter what uh, privileges they come from, underprivileged or, uh, you know, in, in living, even if they're financially independent, doing the most well for themselves but what is that one thing that is common for all you, you know I'll think? start with a statistic which I mean may not see, will not surprise any woman I think in this audience but me um, in urban India uh, the average woman who's also working outside the home spends about five hours doing housework care work you know cooking cleaning even if you have a nanny or a cook or cleaner, coordinating, making lists, all of that. Men spend 29 minutes. That's the gap. So true. And so I think the one thing that is common in this holds in rural areas as well is time poverty. Uh, women just have no time for themselves. And this comes up in the book because if you want to watch Shah Rukh, you need to have free time to watch Shah Rukh. Where will you find free time? If you're constant, if you're working outside the home, plus when you're inside, you're constantly tending to other things, good luck, right? Trying to find that space for yourself. Um, and so all these women are just constantly scrambling because time poverty rates are really high for women. So that's one thing that's common. There's another thing that's very, com that's in common, Saru, and I think it's, um, it's the fact that women cannot live on their own. It doesn't matter which class you belong to. Uh, there are women in the story, and I talk about myself as a single woman. I live in a very posh neighborhood in Delhi. It's miserably hard to find a house on your own and to live on your own, which is safe, secure, not scrutinized. Uh, you don't have to deal with the kind of nuisance. There's an economics of nuisance that India and context of classical patriarchy are set up with. 
it doesn't matter, it gets worse of course as you move down the income chain, but across the board, and it doesn't matter by the way if it's you're, you're in the north or the south, I mean these issues about the housing market, credit markets, safety, law and order, particularly when it comes to women, are constant across. They might be a bit better in a few matrilineal societies, but even now we see states like Kerala are reporting very high rates of violence against women too. And it's not easy again in Kerala for a single woman to live on her own, it's just not. Uh, and so I think the second thing that is very common is for a woman to just claim independent space for herself and to say I will exit out of what is the traditional script of womanhood which is marriage and motherhood. Good luck to any woman irrespective of which class she belongs to. If you decide to take that, you will suffer in this country. It's designed to make women who make those choices suffer. And then of course it's not that if you don't make those choices and you choose to be a mother and married, you will suffer as well, but exactly. then you'll suffer with time poverty. So it's really wonderful, the equilibrium that we've set up for women in our country. And there are pockets of hope, but I, you asked yeah. me what were the two things that were common, yeah. I would say safe spaces, the lack of that, the fact that markets don't like women, um, especially if they're not coupled, and the other is time poverty. So truly said, and I could relate very well to the time poverty thing, and it's a uh, new jargon for me, and I'm going to use that a lot because I'm a mother of a five-year-old. You must use it. Please, please pass it on <laughs> to all our, it should enter vocabulary Seriously. now. Seriously, because uh, I'm a mother of a five-year-old myself, and when you rightly said that, uh, you know, we, no matter, if, even if we have house helps, we have, uh, we have husbands who are very understanding and, uh, you know, uh, very cooperative, supportive. But uh, there is still, there are few things that remain constant and it's so deeply conditioned that uh, we even don't realize. I mean, when I have to go out, I, I ask my husband if he can, you know, babysit, <laughs> you know, his own child. Uh, if I have to go somewhere for a day, uh, like today if I have uh, come for an event. So it's very true that uh, time is a luxury for women and uh, even if you are you know, working outside. But there are few certain things even, even for, as a parent that are expected out of you that yeah. you would primarily have to take care of. Yeah, and you know, I, I don't want to, I'm not going to sort of throw men under the bus. I, I think what it is is that it's also that we live in a society where most boys are not conditioned to think of this as their role as well, right? If we raise boys, which I'm sure now, you know, in spaces like these we are, we raise boys to believe that, hey, helping out at home, um, I can see what that lady did there and that young man is now so embarrassed he's turned pink. <laughs> we're sorry, we're sorry we're doing that. I'm picking out on people. <laughs> Um, and, and I think, you know, I, I, I do think if we raise boys, and I describe this in the book, which is, you know, one of the women I followed during the pandemic said to me, you know, she was so exhausted, she'd do the one-pot meal, then help the kid with homework. And it's not like her husband doesn't want to help, it's just yeah. that he doesn't have the skills to do it. It's not his fault, he's also not been trained. And he's learning, and then she actually said to me, she said, you know, it's more of a nuisance to train him, so I'll just do it on my own, because it's just True. easier, right? So why bother trying to teach him when it's just going to take up more effort? And so she would relax at the end of the day by watching Shah Rukh films because now most of them are on Netflix and Amazon. And she'd like switch, close the door at the end of the day, she told me at midnight or something she'd finish and then she'd watch the movies. And her husband would feel really guilty and, and, and I think it is an issue of can we raise boys to think of these roles as being equally shared? And there are skills, right? Like housework is a skill. Uh, these are skills that we should not just think as being only, you know, for women's bodies to perform. These are for everyone. Right now, India is in the bottom five when it comes to the share of men doing housework in the world. We share this distinction with Syria, Pakistan, South Korea. Not surprised. Uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a really bad equilibrium. So more power to you, young sir, if you're going to do housework as a, as a young man. I think that's fabulous and help out. <laughs> um, but, but, um, <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. And he's so embarrassed now. I'm going to stop picking on him now. But yeah, but, but I, 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 do, I do want to sort of use this opportunity since I think all of us are really, you know, we're nurturing young minds here. I think what's really important is maybe to expose boys as well to literature, to 
mimic behaviors as well, where they start to think of these as shared chores and shared tasks. I think that is where social change happens, not in Twitter and like screaming, shouting. Absolutely. These are the things that matter. Charity begins at home. And so important, yeah, I uh, rightly said that this, it's very important to teach our, uh, especially, you know, young boys about life skills, uh, which in our country is uh, majorly uh, taught to young girls, that like, considering their responsibility. Of course, it's changing, but then we have to keep talking about it. And uh, we need to talk about these more at uh, places I feel that uh, our voices don't reach, where people, they, they, they don't really understand what we are saying. Like this language, I think again, it becomes a very big barrier. You know, we are, we are talking amongst mostly people who already understand, but I think we really need to uh, <laughs> make... Yeah. I'll tell you a you funny know, story, right. okay, this is related to this, which is, has anyone here watched a film called Rabne Banadi Jori, which is Shah Rukh's film? Raise your hand if you've seen it, okay. Now, you know, there's a sequence in that film where his wife has made a tiffin for him and he is serenading the tiffin in the song as if it were like a Bollywood actress. As if she, the tiffin is wearing a chiffon sari, he's dancing with it. There was a young woman from rural Jharkhand who I followed in the book, I've known her a decade. She said to me, and I think this is where popular culture helps because your rights are English and our ways of speaking about it are not exactly. going to help. Women don't know feminism and feminist jargon. Uh, what she said to her brothers and to everyone she knows and to me is if you can be as happy as Shah Rukh is about the tiffin that Anushka Sharma has made in the movie, you are a good man and your wife and your like sisters and others will be happy, right? So this is just an example of how popular culture has exactly. such power in making some of these concepts more accessible to people. And Shah Rukh, I think we have to give him credit. I mean, he's always cutting subsies or doing something or the other, despite the fact that he's played stalkers and terrible men in many of the films. But there are other films where he's always helping in housework. And women constantly, through the interviews that I've had, would keep pointing to that stuff. Like one woman said to me, I'd never seen a hero cut a vegetable before. Uh, before he did it in DDLJ and it became this like, and he was not a cook because the only other time it was done was Rajesh Khanna in Bavarchi where Rajesh Khanna was playing a cook. Um, and so I think popular cinema has that really powerful hold and you see it in the book how people draw on those images to then have a more accessible conversation within their own families and intimate spaces. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Saru, I'll just interrupt here. Yeah. I was just sitting and I was counting apart from the people who are working, there are nine men here, young boys and men, right? So I thought it would be a nice, uh, at this juncture, to ask me, anyone who has have any questions. Sure. I think you, I think it's right, right? Yeah? So, I can see you smirking for a long <laughs> time. Poor guy. <laughs> okay. So, is she, I mean, I'm not picking on anybody, but I know you've got a lovely question in your mind. No, I'm okay. I, I totally buy this point, what yeah. you're saying. And uh, uh, I spend quite a lot of time with my wife in terms of we balancing the, the whole equilibrium of the house. And uh, uh, a lot of things, you know, I take care as well uh, in terms of managing kids, uh, cooking food and things like that. So, so I totally buy this point. Yeah. More power to you. More power to you. Yeah. Wonderful able to do the things that she does, yeah. And you know, in the book you see this, so many women, uh, you know, in the top 20% of India right now, the richest 20% which all of us are part of, amongst married women, only 6.5% hold a job. And one of the major reasons is because we don't have enough men like this gentleman here who help out. Um, and I think that is a big shift, so thank you. I think more power to you for that. Any questions, young boy? Sure. <laughs> I, I, I want to hear the rap later, yeah, but that's... I know, I was, I, was about to, I was about to ask him about the rap. Can we have the first two lines or something like that? Yeah. Oh, the music is coming. Any questions from you? No? Yes. Alright, so I've been recently married. It has been two years. I consider myself uh, to be helpful to my wife. And I want to be that way at the household so my kids can also learn from yeah. that. Uh, could you tell me one behavioral change for men uh, that would really impact uh, 
the woman yeah. in the house just yeah. one one yeah. thing that you know, might go unnoticed because i feel yeah. i'm educated i'm modern but i could be blind towards it so if you can enlighten us yeah i think i think there are two things which are quite which seem to be something that keep coming up at least in the interviews amongst our milieu it's very different in different spaces one is i keep hearing women saying well when i ask then you know so proactively just maybe hanging around the kitchen and not being on the phone and on tv right like that's just one one very simple thing even if you're a nuisance and she kicks you out of the kitchen be the person who gets kicked out of the kitchen but just hang around because i think True. sometimes just that presence and she's 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 like yeah, so oh, I, yes. yeah she's you yeah so i'm getting unanimous endorsement here so that's one and the other is you know all of us have help right i mean we fortunately belong to a class of people who can rely on you know people who we pay to do sometimes i think what a lot of women would say to me and i don't know if this is true for your home sir but i would hear women saying somehow almost automatically managing the house help has become my job like coordinating so maybe you can divide up days where there could be days when it's actually your day when you are the one responsible for checking is she coming on time if she needs some instructions if you even just have days like that i think that is a nice way to also segregate so just i think more proactivity and and a little bit of just um thinking maybe on a weekend about what chores are coming up over the next month particularly when it comes to kids right and thinking about what's the best way to divide them because there might be things actually which will always remain unequal especially if you have kids at a very young age mothering will require more labor because of just the nature of the body right so maybe thinking about times then that you can balance things out so yeah i think but hang around the kitchen sharak does that all the time and all these women seem to love it um and i think part of it is this But I was thinking when you are being kicked out of the kitchen, carry the garbage. <laughs> That might be very good. Yeah. Dispose it off. Why not? Yes. Th- yeah. Okay. There's a lady, question. I think. So an interesting observation again during the pandemic was, and I think I read this four days ago, that uh, of all the population, the working population that we had uh, during the pandemic, we have lost 31 percent. Yes. of uh, the women workforce because it became impossible for them to manage homes and manage workplaces from homes yeah and uh, that was quite a lot uh, so that was one aspect that uh, really bothered me because uh, i think women have this natural ability to multitask i have rarely not that men can't but i have rarely found it in men that they can multitask but women somehow even if you're not a mother it comes naturally to you to multitask you can do many things at the same time but one thing that i found and um, sorry i'm a snoody bombay girl who's just moved here oh uh, usually i snoody <laughs> city is better than ours for sure huh? So uh one thing that struck me when I moved here and because it's a new school and I'm doing interviews is I have found women constantly telling me that uh my father gave me permission to work yeah. or my husband allows me to work and it has shocked me a little mm. uh, because we are in the 21st century somebody giving you permission to educate yourself or somebody giving you permission to work was so out of context for me yeah but you know i have to tell you that is that is re- i mean if you read this book permission culture and by the way this exists in bombay too i think you probably you and i belong to our own little yes. bubbles in delhi and bombay um in fact one thing i realized for so many women you know there are women who are willing to say well forget i don't need permission i'm just going to do what i want to but as women we are also trained to want i mean there's a kind of love and approval that we want not just e- from our immediate husband but there's a entire sort of familial ecosystem i think men sometimes are encouraged to sort of say no you know to hell with it and men i think are also loved in a more unconditional way in our society it's it's you know whereas women have to jump through a few hoops so you have to be a good you know why if you have to look a certain way you have to be dutiful all of that stuff right and you will be loved extra you will be loved and i think it's this love which is actually the lever economists now 
call these things hidden taxes. So what they say is, and I get into this, get into this in the book, which is economists such as Sandil Mulailathan and various others have been studying how when people start to behave in ways that society doesn't really want them to, right? Like women, for example, wanting to work extra hours outside the home, as an example, or a woman wanting to put her kid in daycare. That's another example that comes up in the book. There are taxes that their loved ones place on them, and taxes not in rupees or dollars, but in emotions making you feel unloved, making you feel unworthy, making you feel lonely, which is why it's called India's Lonely Young Women, because I contend that any woman who's decided to hold on to an independent livelihood in India is deviating from a very fundamental script of what womanhood in India is supposed to be. Um, and I think maybe all of us are perhaps here united in that deviation. And maybe each one of us has felt some form of this loneliness or pain in our lives in one way or the other. So yes, I think that permission culture is everywhere, but it's deeply tied up in these notions of love. And that is what is actually navigating what we're seeing in the economy. What you said about um, the rural workforce, you know, I have a graph literally on the first page of the book. And if anybody asks me, what is the book about? It's actually an emotional story of the stories behind these statistics. And you'll see rural employment for women has collapsed the most. Urban has always stayed fairly low, um, but rural has really, I mean, it's halved. And it's a very complex story. Two big reasons, and we're seeing the pandemic almost push this further, is one, at a time when India's incomes grew up, so, so post-liberalization, households' incomes just boomed. Rural, urban, didn't matter. And we call this the income effect, where actually when household incomes go up, Indian families almost want to purchase more conservative values. So they say, okay, now the girl can stay at home and be a full-time mother and a carer. Uh, she doesn't really need to go out. And what's fascinating is you see this particularly also in OBC families, because they start to mimic certain upper caste rituals around, you know, sociologists call this Sanskritization. And this idea is that you almost start to inherit and show these kinds of behaviors. Similar stories were seen with sex selective abortion, but that's now a bit more sort of noisy in terms of where that's going. But in income and employment, you still see this, this very odd correlation. So that's one. And the other thing that's happened, which is actually a more complex thing, and it links to, I think, what Saru and I were talking about earlier, is that, you know, because of primary education, there are economists who've shown that now rural women have more primary literacy than they did even generations before because of Sarshik Shabiyan in particular. What that's done is your ability as a mother to improve the reading, human capital of your kids at home is actually much higher than your grandmother's was, right? In rural areas in particular. So the household makes a decision that actually your ad hoc income outside in agrarian labor or migrant work is not as valuable to us as opposed to you just staying at home and making sure our kids grow up to be more healthy, more productive with higher human capital. So it's actually a mix of things. It's not completely negative what you're seeing because that might actually have spillover effects for the positive in the future, but it's very layered. But it's certainly the case that India is one of the rare exceptions in the world where as incomes go up, typically women's employment goes up as well. India and Turkey are now the only two countries which have seen the exact opposite, and China now is slowly starting to dip. But I think that's because of a different set of reasons. But India has this very unique position. I describe there are hosts of reasons because of this, the way we've grown, the sectors that have grown, all of that. But rural is actually where the big push has happened. And the one thing about the pandemic that's very important is five out of ten working women are yet to come back after the pandemic. And that's a very worrying statistic. Men have come back. More precarious jobs, but they've come back. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there is uh, the problem of time, you know, always. Yeah? And this is one conversation which just can go on, yeah. right? Just can go on. Like he just mentioned, it's so counterintuitive. What, yeah. I mean, the entire thing that we, we would want it the other way. Yeah. If things improve at home, well, let everybody flourish. Why is it that one part has to go back, right? Um, so this book is available upstairs, but uh, we will wait for her to go and sign the book because we'll have uh, Neil doing a bit of storytelling uh, for everyone. Yeah, she is somewhere around. Before that, Akshada, if you could do the honors and uh, and felicitate.
Shania. Shayana. Shayana. Or, I don't know why, because I know so many of the other kind. Yeah, Shania. Shania. It's just wonderful. What do you think? Seriously, because this has been a subject which has been very, very close to my heart. I didn't know this existed. I'm so sorry. Is it for the mic? No. Akshada, you need the mic? No, I'm just having a chat. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I love diapers and lipstick. That's a lovely combination. I'll always remember it. Yeah.